Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I want to start with something that we all know, uh, with a slight um, uh, shading of guilt, that we're in the middle of a memory boom now, and this meeting is part of it. Uh, the urge or political necessity of finding some way to locate the First World War in the narratives of nations has uh, turned global. Uh, it is um, a worldwide phenomenon, uh, which I think is part of a much longer uh, development of interest in commemoration and, and an individual memory um, that locates the two world wars in um, a binary, in a binding together of uh, family history and uh, national and international history that began in 1914 and has continued until today. Um, but I want to talk about some unusual features of this commemorative moment. Um, because in this season of commemoration, there has been a great deal of activity that is not only reflective, but also reflexive. That is, there is increasing attention by those engaged in commemoration and examining what they and millions of others are doing when they, like us in this hall, remember in public the 1914-18 conflict. I think this is a very welcome development for many reasons. First, it enables us to treat remembrance as a cultural practice at the local level, open to ethnographic work linking kinship and politics. Uh, my fundamental premise is that families do the work of remembrance and addressing the astonishingly varied initiatives emerging in civil society tells us much about the inability of states and national leaders to script the way people remember war and the victims of war. I don't believe that states tell people how to remember. People tell the states how they want to remember. Now, reviewing these developments also reinforces the chastening view, and this is something I take very personally, and my colleagues, I will look forward to hearing their views of it. Reviewing these developments over the past year has reinforced the chastening view to me and to other historians that we are secondary players in this game. We historians do not script the narratives of war. Broad populations accept about war in general and the Great War in particular. So if political leaders and academic scholars in the field of history do not shape the story of the Great War, then who does? My tentative answer to this question is that families do. And alongside broader associative networks, they primarily use images, photographic, filmic, and now digital, as their fundamental point of reference. And here's my second assumption. What people, what people see, I believe, matters much more than what they read. And there is, I think, a visual archive of the First World War to which people put captions that don't come from David Stevenson's book or from my book or from a hundred other sources, uh, but come from a series of grand narratives about the First World War, which are, in many respects, better termed myths rather than histories. Myths in the sense of narratives people need in order to live their lives. The visual of you know, seeing war in that sense of uh, imagining it visually mediated in this way is, of course, not seeing war at all. But the visual comes as close as possible to providing a nonverbal lexicon and a grammar of war, which has lasted an entire century and which now exists all over the world. <clears throat> now, I want to s divide my talk into three parts. First of all, talk about the extraordinary efflorescence of remembrance practices. Uh, to, to show some examples of what is, and there will be other historians who know much more about other cases. Then I want to talk, secondly, about what isn't, and there is not a European uh, remembrance of the First World War. It is very much different in Eastern Europe, uh, and even more different uh, in Asia uh, than in Western Europe. And the third point I want to talk about is uh, what is special about 2014 uh, in terms of the replacement of what uh, the uh, great scholars and dear friends Jan and Elida Osman call communicative memory by cultural memory. That's the three parts of my, my lecture. Now, let's talk about uh, what is. Commemoration always has four facets. It's always about politics. It's always a business. It's always about form. Lieu de memoir literally means that. And it's always about ritual. And we should never, ever lose track of the fact that people make money out of remembrance 
and that those who want to engage in acts of remembrance need money to do it, including this meeting. So I want to draw to your attention to a series of forms uh, in which remembrance is taking place and will take place over the next year and possibly the next four years related to the First World War, providing pilgrimages and tourist packages, toys, replicas, and kits for all tastes, books for all ages, films, museum exhibitions, many radio and television series, talk shows, documentaries, lectures, maybe too many lectures, I hope not this one, uh, now all require money, and this money comes from many sources, not only and not primarily from national funds. The memory boom will make a fortune out of the Great War and out of the conversion of the story of the war into a light consumer durable good. I want to show you some of them. This is the Vimy pilgrimage of 2014, at which I'm going to speak. Um, and it, it is bringing 1,500 Canadians to the site of a victorious battle in which Canadian forces shoved the German army off an escarpment uh, not far from Arras in uh, 1914. And the, in the image, you see the sign of the, of, the, of the break in the stone, literally the rupture in the life of Canada and the life of the world that is part of the grand narrative. Uh, this is a, a, a memorial that I want to talk about in uh, more general terms. Uh, of bereavement and not of triumphalism. It's a very interesting matter that most war memorials that, uh, that are being, uh, as it were, um, visited this year, in my experience, uh, do not celebrate, they commemorate. And the fundamental point is celebration has a taste of ashes attached to it in a war in which 10 million people died and 25 million people were mutilated or otherwise uh, uh, wounded. Um, here is Major and Mrs. Holt's battlefield tours, which perhaps some of our speakers have been on or guided. I have a feeling one person in the front row can tell you more about this than I can. Uh, but the important point is, it leaves out the Historia de la Grande Guerre, a museum of the Great War, uh, which I'm fortunate enough to help build and still help run, um, because it has what I would call a, a proud and almost gove-like uh, um, uh, appreciation of the victory of the British Army uh, in uh, 1918, as if you know, Brits alone did it. Um, and th that is not, precisely not the, uh, the way in which the museum I referred to deals with its business. I am gonna do this on the 1st of July, though. It's in what's called uh, the, the Great Hole in the Ground at La Boiselle. Um, and it is at this point where a group of Northumberland soldiers came across no man's land holding hands, literally across the field, and, and were, uh, were, were uh, shot down by uh, German soldiers who survived this. This is the great La Grande Mine, I shouldn't say Grange, La Grande Mine la, at La Boiselle, and it blew up at 7.30 in the morning of the 1st of July, 1916. The reason why it's still there is that the Northumberland families of those who were killed bought it, money again. And every year they come with their Northumberland bagpipes, not Scots bagpipes, but Northumberland ones, to commemorate those uh, who died there. And what you should understand is that this hole in the ground destroyed a substantial part of the German line, but not enough, because the, the deep penetrating uh, um, artillery didn't uh, destroy the, the position uh, to the right or the left, quite literally, of this hole in the ground. So at this point, and at that point, German deep bunkers um, in which men uh, were sheltered allowed them to come up their ladders right here and right here and they simply shot down, I think it was 70% casualties in the first uh, 30 minutes. I'm pretty sure that's right, I have to check that figure. But basically, this hole in the ground is a sacred site. And the point about commemoration is that the sacred costs money. It is something that you need to maintain and that you need to uh, recognize as, uh, uh, is profane in, in equal part. This is Nottingham commemorates the Great War. I'm gonna join a group of school children from Trent to the Trenches and go through a series of battlefield uh, uh, tours. Um, and even though the British government is providing money for children to come, uh, the parents are paying for most of it. Uh, I did ask the headmaster who's dealing with this how much each of the children's families is paying, and, and the answer is between four and 500 pounds, and that's an, an, an not inconsiderable sum. Then there are people who make money out of publishing things. And here again is a kind of narrative that First World War historians cringe at because it sells much more copies than we do. Um, horrible histories. At, uh, Terry 
uh, Deer, whom, whom I know, uh, and should have a Y at the end of his name, Terry Deary has made a fortune. He's really made a packet. He's made a killing out of the war. And um, there are many different I I I examples of this. The internet, anybody who wants to, and, I, and indeed I found this on Europeana, which is this wonderful portal of First World War archives. There's also a Europeana link to the internet and to eBay and such like, where you can buy things like this. This is a game to defend Langemark uh, that was a 1914 product, right, as it were, after the, uh, the battle, uh, the, the uh, toy makers got into, the, got into the business of commemorating the battle and selling games so that children could see how wonderful uh, war is. This one is expensive, $1,200, but if you want to save your pennies, you can get a Vickers machine gun uh, for only $300. Then there is the big business of the history of art. All over the world, there are now, and I, I mean that, having just come back from Singapore and and Tokyo, there are art exhibitions of the art of the First World War, and rightly so, rightly so. And this one in particular in the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn is about what happened to avant-garde artists when they put on uniforms. It's not how they painted the war alone, it's who they were. And when you see, for example, Brock in his uniform before he went off and Picasso next to him, and then Picasso putting on Brock's uniform, you begin to see something about the, as it were, the sociability, the social networks that people brought into the First World War. Uh, there are all kinds of people, like Max Ernst in uniform you couldn't possibly imagine, but nonetheless, there he is. And then there is theater. And I want to talk about this uh, simply because I'm in the middle of writing a paper on, on Kitsch in the Great War, and we should not under, um, underestimate the extent to which sentimental messages are attached to the First World War in every shape and size. And some of them are saccharine and sweet. This one is not. This is a story that was written as a schoolboy's story. Um, I think I've learned how to pronounce his name. Now it's Michael Morpago. Is that close? Good. Sorry? Morpago. Mur I'll, I'll pronounce and get it right one of these days. Um, in fact, I'm speaking with him next Wednesday in a, a meeting uh, in London on how to teach the First World War to school children. Um, and he did this wonderful book in which the narrator is the horse, Joey. And then it was turned by a company of genius in South Africa, in Cape Town, into a play on the, on the National Theater. Uh, and take a look, these are, these are puppets. These are puppets that created the most spectacularly real horses by making them imaginary. The imaginary, the, 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 the non-pseudo-realistic carried reality with it. And it carried reality, I think, on the stage in a clear, what I would call, imaginary landscape in a way that Steven Spielberg's film of the same story never did. There was something about, as it were, the, the iconography of the First World War that touches both fantasy and horror, both fascination and repulsion. And this play, which I don't know how many people have seen it, but my guess is in the millions, certainly in the millions, has within it that charge of the sacred of the First World War, which is on the edge of kitsch. It's on the edge of the super sentimental story of a child saving his horse by somehow finding him on the Western Front among the eight million horses that were mobilized. He managed to find Joey and bring him back and so on. It is an astonishing story of the commercialization of commemoration and of the dangers of over-sentimentalizing the First World War. And I think, by the way, kitsch is a great subject for somebody out there since there are national codes of sentimentality that, that di differ radically. They're not the same by any means. Having lived in, in Britain for 35 years and raised my children there, I can assure you that my children's sense of kitsch is entirely different from my, my own well-developed sense. Uh, <laughs> now, I want to s say um, that while we know what is happening, we have to uh, recognize uh, that there is a political story here that needs to be told. We have to ask the question, who is doing the work of remembrance and how do they do it? And I can venture the beginnings of the answer in this, as it were, middle part of my lecture to that question, in part because I've lived a transnational life. One of the things that is the point of the uh, Cambridge History of the First World War, fortunately I can say that it's three volumes that have already been published, one in French, but the other two are coming out in French. It's the first time the French, the Cambridge History has been published in French, it's never happened before. And it's making the point that the First World War was a transnational event or it was nothing. Treating it as a national phenomenon is both necessary and limiting. It has to be a national story because that's why people went and died. 
But it isn't only a national story, and by making it a transnational story, we can write better national history. That's the purpose of the uh, Cambridge history of the First World War, uh, of which I am indeed uh, proud. I'm also proud, David Stevenson is one of the authors sitting here, um, that all of the authors have agreed to give their money to a fund for graduate work in history on the First World War anywhere in the world, uh, since we were lucky. I mean, when I came into the profession, getting a job was not easy, but it was nothing as hard as it is today. And anyone here who's uh, thinking of doing graduate work in the First World War, uh, my email is eponymous at Yale. I'd be happy to help you out. We have now a fund of 40,000 pounds to start with, and all the royalties of the three volumes in the future will go to that purpose. Now, what I want to say is that I've been a transnational person, you know, Polish origins, wound up in the States, uh, thanks to the Holocaust, uh, came back to Europe, taught in um, Jerusalem, then Warwick, uh, then Cambridge, and now in the States until I retire next year. Um, so I, I think I know a thing or two about the fact that the historical profession has been transformed over the last 30 years by the expansion of the tertiary sector of higher education. And what it has allowed are people, like our colleague John Horn is a perfect example, who were born in one country, were educated in a second, and teach in a third. These transnational perspectives, I think, have given us an insight into the First World War that frankly was not uh, available before, when the national unit was the only one that individuals uh, chose. So I've been involved in a couple of inquiries and fascinated by a fourth, and I just want to tell you about four of them. I won't speak about Britain because there are others here who know much more about it than I do. I want to talk about France, Ireland, Australia, and Belgium, very briefly. First, France. I've been fortunate to serve as a member of the French Presidential Commission on the commemoration of the centenary of the Great War. Here, fictive kinship really operates, since I'm not French, but I've written a couple of books with the president of the commission, Antoine Pro. So it's pure nepotism. Um, this commission has as its brief to coordinate the upsurge in public events marking the passage of 100 years from the day the Great War began. It has a budget of 20 million euros to start with and, and more to come. Our brief included the scrutiny of now 1,800 local projects, 1,800 local projects, I repeat, which aim to secure the labellisation in French, or the imprimatur of the Centennial Commission. If you get that, then you can apply for money. But it's meant to uh, get rid of things that are outrageous or completely uh, um, uh, false. Now, scrutinizing these, which has taken months, uh, roughly 800 have been approved. And these are all local so far. And they share five features. The first is that they come from local groups and individuals, not from political parties or the state. They speak for civil society. My point, that the state is not the major actor. The state is an actor, obviously, but not the major actor. And the reason why it's an actor is that it gives money to civil society. Civil society is creating the narratives that the state is paying for. Um, and I've watched that happen. Secondly, this is France, but not a single one of these 1,800 dossiers used the word martyrs for the dead of the Great War. There were Catholic uh, submissions and indeed from Catholic associations, but they used Republican language and not Catholic language in doing so. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Thirdly, these projects bore, I think it's true to say, no trace at all of the scholarly publications of the last 30 years of me and my colleagues on all aspects of the First World War. Not a trace, it's as if we didn't exist. <laughs> It was as if historians were phantoms, just brushing past settled and stable stories about the past, which were local and familial in character. That's the point. It comes, they come from the dining room table, the kitchen table. This is what Maurice Halbach's, after all, meant by collective memory, the memory of small groups of people who tell a story of the past, which is stable and impervious to change. In the memory boom of 2014, we historians swim in a current we neither created nor control. The fourth feature of the body of commemorative activity is its transnational character. It is emphatically not limited to white metropolitan France. There are substantial projects which show what Algerians and Moroccans did in the Great War alongside exhibitions, theatrical performance, and cabaret associated with les tirailleurs senegalais, the Vietnamese, and even one from Polynesia. Here is the voice of imperial France now liquidated in history, but very much alive in the space of collective memory of people of all races who now make their home in France and who bring their family memories with them. This cosmopolitan response has a political importance. In his last year in office, President Sarkozy, like Angela Merkel, announced the end of the politics 
of multiple identities, um, of what of multiculturalism, I think it was called, of what Hispanic activists in the United States call living on the hyphen, like being Spanish Americans. Now a socialist government under Francois Hollande has found a way to revive multiculturalism through the commemoration of the Great War, to make the commemoration of the Great War more than a white phenomenon and more than a French phenomenon. And one way in which this has happened is through what's called the Grand Collect. And this is an announcement in the press from the Archive Nationale and from the Bibliothèque Nationale that anybody with family papers and, f and images can either donate them to the Archive Nationale or to the Bibliothèque Nationale or have them digitized and they're on record and take the originals home. And the result has been 1,200 new archives, that is to say 1,200 new fonds, uh, which historians can use. It's from all over the place and they are extraordinary. And of course they've been lying in attics for years, decades perhaps, uh, waiting for an opportunity uh, to be dis uh, disposed of by families who've now found a better home. Fifthly, this body of popular commemorative initiatives is by and large pacifist. I think this is a, a quite extraordinary and surprising. It is a reflection perhaps of the importance of ancien combattants, veterans in France, and of their pacifist traditions. The government took one decision which reflected its recognition of the electoral importance of veterans, and believe me, the presidency of Francois Hollande needs a hell of a lot more than this in order to survive. It decided to braid together commemoration of 1914 and 1944, to bring the two together and make both moral narratives about the liberation of French soil from occupation armies and by putting 1944 into the narrative next to 1914, pointing to the European Union. In the contested history of the Second World War in France, the only point on which everyone agrees is that 1944 saw the liberation of France from German occupation. Vir virtually everything else about the sorry history of France under occupation, and in particular about the war between collaborators and resistors, is a highly contested terrain as it is in this country. Not so the theme of liberation. In this narrative, 1914 saw the arrival of one million uninvited German guests on French soil, soil where they remained for four years until they were forcibly ejected by armies from everywhere in the world. The veterans of the Great War, now all gone, accomplished this feat of arms at the cost of 1,400,000 men killed and twice their number injured. Half of the French army were casualties of war. The survivors created a powerful veterans movement, one of the very few which were pacifist in outlook. Their moral authority to talk about war and to demand its abolition was unquestioned, that is, until Hitler made their stance untenable. After the debacle of 1940, thousands of them joined the resistance and went back to war, despite the repugnance of having to do so. The political message of 1914 and 1944 has been institutionalized in the French government's nomination of four grands résistants to have their remains removed to the Panthéon, not someone from 1914, in 2014, but people from 1944. Great people, unquestionably extraordinary. Uh, Geneviève de Gaulle, who was one of the great women resistance leaders. Uh, Germain Tillon, an anthropologist, a filmmaker, a great Catholic mystic um, who survived uh, Ravensbrück to testify at the trial of the Roman Catholic priest who betrayed them to the Gestapo. Uh, Jean Zay, who was a French minister of national education who was uh, uh, murdered in 1944, partly because he was half Jewish, partly because he was a symbol of the, of the French Popular Front. Um, and Pierre Brossolette, who was second in the French resistance and had the courage uh, when he was caught by the Gestapo uh, to literally jump down a staircase of six flights and commit suicide rather than risk giving up the names uh, of his colleagues. They are great figures, but it's in the con commemoration of the First World War that the, as it were, braiding together of the liberation of France uh, twice uh, has been, uh, has been to a degree sanctified, I think is the right way to put it. And there is another story, others of you have heard this uh, in my appearance, in my, my happy appearances in, uh, in Oslo in the past. Of course, the point is that the French veterans movement is also the, the place where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, through, written in part by uh, the French veteran leader René Cassin comes from. So the link between Europe today, the link between the integration of Europe today and the disintegration of 1914 in France has a very specific pacifist character and it is there, no one doubts it, not in the slightest. No one uses the word triumph. No one talks about the last hundred days in French scholarship as the great victory. There are, may, there are ways in which, of course, uh, there is uh, 
a, a series of contestations and I'm, I'm summarizing miserably, that is to say much too radi rapidly, but nonetheless, the French commemorative moment is a move away from war. What about Ireland? And here we have others who uh, can speak better on this than I. I want to suggest that the Irish case shows the way contemporary politics affect and transform commemoration. The Good Friday Agreement of 1998 transformed the sectarian conflict in Northern Ireland and the shape of First World War commemoration as a whole. In the space of 16 years, 1914 and 1916 have been literally fused together. Now it is no longer necessary to choose between them. And I've just had confirmation from Keith Jeffrey, that I'll leave the British side of this out, uh, that these two gentlemen are going to be there at Ulster Tower on the 1st of July. I have, I have read about this on several occasions, uh, and I've now had it confirmed by someone who knows much better than I, that it is indeed true that Ian Paisley on the right, you know, the firebrand of uh, Protestant uh, loyalism, and uh, Jerry Adams, uh, the uh, former uh, Sinn Féin leader, will be cheek by jowl, side by side, embracing the First World War <laughs> as a moment uh, of tragedy uh, uh, which tore apart Ireland. Now, the way they've done it, I think, is quite interesting for historians because they've done it by taking an accordion to the, to the chronology of the First World War and making, turning the war into what John Horne and Robert uh, Gervart call the Greater War. By using the frame of 1912 to 22, they're able to talk about tragedies of multiple kinds and contradictory aims, all within the same breath. Now, what's intriguing to me um, is that this has happened <clears throat> at a time when the Roman Catholic Church has lost much of its authority, not only in, in Ireland, of course, but in other parts of the world. And it's led me to believe that in many respects, what we should understand is that commemoration and the sites of commemoration, uh, museums, battlefields, cemeteries, are the cathedrals of the 21st century. They're the place where sacred themes are expressed, which previously would have been expressed in places within the, what might be described as, uh, as uh, within the, uh, uh, the great uh, churches uh, of our you know, shared experience. There is, of course, a, a difference between Eastern and Western Europe. I'm going to come to that in a moment or two. But now I want to take you to another place which is different, and that is Gallipoli. The language of sacrifice and martyrdom are still very much alive in Turkey. Gallipoli next year is going to have uh, an absolute avalanche of visitors. In fact, the Australian... Um, uh, High Commissioner, uh, uh, both in London and the Australian Foreign Office in, um, uh, in Canberra, have literally closed Gallipoli to Australian visitors. There's no more space for them. There'll be 90,000 Australians who come to Gallipoli in 24-25 uh, April to mark the centenary of the landing that created the Australian nation, they believe. Now, what's extraordinary about it is that it takes the form of a, a kind of uh, alliance between uh, Turks and Australians. And in many respects, this raises the political difficulty. The difficulty is that there will be an extraordinary remembrance of Australians, Turks, and New Zealanders about that day. The question is how to put in the fact that the day 25, April 1915, was also the first day of the unfolding of the Armenian Genocide. What to do about the Armenians is a major political problem, and it's one that I don't know the answer to. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I think it may have more of a flexibility now than ever before, in part because of the Ukraine and Crimea, in part because of Syria. The Turks, I think, have a notion that being closer to Europe might not be the worst thing in the world uh, in the future, and there's one condition they have to fulfill. They have to sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in fact they did uh, in the European Convention of Human Rights before they walked out, and they have to admit that the, Euro the Armenian Genocide actually happened. Will this be the moment when they do so? I don't know. It will come. Who knows? You know, there was an East German joke. I remember there were jokes in East Germany. It wasn't exactly the most fun place in the world, and the joke has it that uh, in 1919, after the Spartacus uprising, um, which, in which uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were murdered, um, they woke up and they were utterly astonished to find themselves in heaven. Not only were they shocked about that, but they found themselves 10 feet from God. And Liebknecht gets up and walks to God and says, God, when will we see the revolution? And God says, not in my time, my son. <laughs> now, it may be that that is really what 
the, uh, the problem with the Armenian genocide will resolve in, but maybe not, maybe not. And there is, I think, an opening, just the beginning of an opening in the way in which Turkish academics are inviting people like me and others who worked on the Armenian genocide to speak about it now at the commemorative moment. And look what they've done. They basically used the idea of the brotherhood of, of sacrifice and the bro brotherhood of bloodshed. Why not include the Armenians? Why not? Now, this is, this is a question I put to many uh, 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 Turkish diplomats and scholars. The problem in Turkey is that First of all, the military archives have remained closed, and secondly, a lot of the people who know the full documented story get arrested for plotting the overthrow of the current Turkish government. This is, this is not a light matter. Uh, so there are political obstacles there that I think uh, 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 we need to keep in mind. But, but look at the language. This is a statement that is a war memorial that is carved at Gallipoli itself. It is a statement that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who was the commander of the forces on the heights that the allied forces never got to, about the sense of loss in all three nations, Australia, New Zealand, and Turkey. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you're now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There's no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us where they lie side by side here in the country, in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace after having lost their lives on this land. They have become our sons as well. The same message can be found on the left in front of the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, and on the right in Wellington at a point not far from which the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, don't forget the Anzacs were Australian and New Zealanders, Australians tend to forget about the New Zealanders, but nonetheless, they left there to go halfway around the world. Now, the question is how to fit the Armenian Genocide into the commemorative uh, moment, and I believe in, in many respects there's a possibility, there's a possibility that now the opening of the chronological framework from 1912 to 23 in the Irish manner provides the space to talk about it because the Balkan Wars were vicious and ugly foretastes of what the First World War would be. And as uh, John Horne and Robert Gavart and other scholars uh, argue, and they've argued it in the Cambridge history of the First World War II, the war didn't stop in 1918. And the murderousness of the war in Turkey was as bad as anything that was happening anywhere else in Eastern Europe. It is a possibility, I think, that the commemorative moment may also be a turn away from the denial of the great secret of the 20th century in Istanbul, a secret after all is what everybody knows and no one says, uh, that genocide happened and happened in the course of the waging of war by another regime, the Ottoman regime is not the Turkish Republic, in another century. The hope is that some kind of sense and reality will come in to that particular story. Now the last one I want to tell you about is the one I know least about, but the one that puzzles me the most. It's Belgium. Belgium is a country divided against itself. The French part of the Belgian state has been at odds with the Flemish or Dutch-speaking part since the First World War itself. In the 1970s, I'm not making this up, the University of Leuven decided that its great library would be divided between a Flemish-speaking university remaining and a French-speaking university to be built. In the opposite of a Solomonic decision, they divided the library in the following manner. One volume on a shelf stayed at Leuven. The next volume on the same shelf went to the new French university library of louvain la neuve where it rests to this day. One volume here. One volume there. I th they didn't read the Bible, I think, or something. <laughs> now, in, in subsequent years, this cultural war has been extended to new fronts. There is now a representative of the, at least I think, non existent government of Flanders. Anyone recognize the nation of Flanders? I haven't heard of it. But they have 22 representatives in 22 countries, including Britain, Germany, and the United States. This is a political body financed by the Flemish speaking part of Belgium because the, the income revenue, the re re income tax, has been as it were, divided between the French-speaking and the Dutch-speaking parts with, Belgium in the, with Brussels in the middle. So they have a lot of money. And their signature tune, believe me, it's not the only tune they give, is commemorating the First World War in a pacifist manner. They also do other things. I'm not kidding. This is from their website in New York. They run a common ground wellness center offering acupuncture, counseling, energy work, medical massage, reconnective breath work, shamanic work, shiatsu, sh Swedish massage, and Thai massage. Uh, there are Dutch courses for children in Flanders House, and of great importance, most importance, is their project about building gardens from the soil of Flanders all over the world, where children will take a bit of soil 
and make the pacifist, as were the pacifist message, is that the children should grow things and not kill things. And this pacifist message, I think, is so clearly, transparently, a political tool to destroy the Belgian state that my argument about the political uh, character of commemoration, I think, has no better uh, example than that. I find it bizarre. They've offered me a, a, an honorary degree at the University of Leuven, and I'm not sure whether that's going in the, the direction of, uh, of, of secession. Um, because there are great scholars, and I, and I think, by the way, the little I know about Belgium is that the historical community, once again, has nothing to do with this, or very little to do with it. They're not running the show. They're not even directing a part of it. They're simply in a place in which people who are not historians are remembering the First World War for political reasons. Okay, now what I want to do is to take away from my claim. There is a very large global commemorative moment underway, and this meeting is part of it. But not everywhere in the world is there a sense of remembrance in the same way as we have. My claim is that there are three overlapping but distinctive memory regimes in operation in different parts of the world today, and the differences between them explain why in some parts of the world the First World War is news, and sometimes unwelcome news, and in other times uh, it is uh, indeed history. I differentiate these three memory regimes by their approach to war and martyrdom. The presence of the term martyr and martyrdom and their correlates varies over time and space, increasing in frequency and significant the further east you go. In the first of the three, the Western European memory regime, the term martyr has largely faded from use. Its decline has been rapid and irreversible in the 20th century. In Eastern Europe, where a second memory regime operates, the notion of martyrdom is still alive and well. Just think about the people killed in Kiev recently and the language used in the newspapers about them. In forming a host of national and religious monuments, most of which refer not to the 1914-18 war, but to the martyrs of the Second World War, which is the phrase they use uh, 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 under the Soviet period. Now think about, this is a third regime in the Middle East and beyond. A third memory regime exists in which the braiding together of war and martyrdom is not only palpable, but at times radioactive. If you want to understand Al-Qaeda, you have to understand what the word uh, martyr means. It's very different. Anti-colonial struggles adopted this framework. The word martyr is used in China for those who did extraordinary things in the Great March and so on. And recently, Islamic radicals have created commemorative practices in parts of Asia and the Far East quite different from those in Europe. From this distinction follows my second point. This will be the sort of anticipation of my closure. It is that the fading away of the lexicon of martyrdom in the Western European memory regime distinguishes the commemoration of 1914 there from commemoration of the Second World War, in which the subject of the Holocaust has become more and more important over time. I have to add, though, that even within Jewish thinking in the uh, Hasidic world I grew up in, uh, there was a, a change in the language of martyrdom from within the Second World War itself. It happened within the Warsaw Ghetto, where a group of extraordinary people who set up an archive called uh, the Onek Shabbat, Onek Shabbos Archive in Yiddish, uh, decided that perhaps it was better not to emphasize to die al Kiddush Hashem, that is to say dying to sanctify the name of the Lord, but to live as sanctifying the Lord, by Kiddush HaChayim, that change. I would argue, has happened in some parts of the analysis of the Holocaust, but not in all. There's still a sacredness attached to Anne Frank's name, to Primo Levi's name. They're both sanctified. Uh, so the Second World War, I believe, is a different space and a different commemorative moment. Now, this leads to the final part of this, as it were, section of my argument. My argument is there is no European remembrance of the First World War. There is a Western European and there is an Eastern European remembrance, and they are radically different. They are not subsumed under what one might be described as a European moment, even within the European Union itself. The Polish language of martyrdom is active and extraordinary, and the Russian one is even more so. Let me give you a couple of examples. There's a quasi-sacred element in the dawn service. Literally, the dawn service is not very far from Easter in Australia. And I went there last year, and there were literally 50,000 people in the cold. It's cold in April in Australia, before the sun rose. And they came to see um, what it was that made their nation 
what it was that gave birth to their nation. It is this kind of thing where a family wraps itself in the flag. And some historians think it's, it's a, a glorification of the military. I'm not sure about that, but there's a book entitled What's Wrong with Anzac that's really quite interesting. But you see the people at the bottom of this, of this particular, um, they're, they're literally at the dawn service, uh, which of course reminds us of other uh, dawning moments in that season of the year. This is where this, this, the sacred and the profane mix the really big event in Australia on the 25th of, uh, of April is an Australian rules football match. Don't ask me to explain what an Australian rules football match is. I have no idea except the, the, the men wear the tightest shorts I've ever seen in any sporting occasion. That also needs some explanation and my friend, Australian friends I think will give it this year. But the thing is, it's, it, it is a sacred moment. 100,000 people go to this, and they have the two-minute silence, and then they, they kick it off and whatever else uh, they do. But it's, it's a way of expressing a metaphor of war as a game. The sporting occasion is a game in which people literally fight to the last ounce of their energy, and then they get up and go home. The First World War was that game where people didn't get up. It is an extraordinary, as it were, and, and I, I think very profane, money-making, and possibly a desacralizing form that we have to care, uh, bear in mind. Now look, the one in Japan I just saw when they had their very first First World War conference, uh, you know, full First World War conference in Tokyo and Kyoto ever, um, there have been, of course, individual speakers, but this was a different project on the national level. They took us to the Yasukuni Shrine. Oh, martyrdom, people who die for the emperor become gods, including those who commit war crimes. This is an extraordinary sight, and every time the, the Japanese prime minister visits it, he gets into a hell of a trouble with a lot of people at home, and in China, too, where there's a museum. This is, let's see if I can show you it. Yeah, this is a museum uh, to the kamikazes. Very moving, very powerful. But the word glory is alive and well in Japan, and it is that which is missing, I think, in First World War Court commemoration. Now let me turn to the conclusion. Oh, I want to show you this extraordinary scene of the uh, martyrs in, in Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church didn't have this problem that the Vatican does, where they actually need some time to, to work through uh, the candidacies of various uh, saints, including you know, uh, uh, Pope John uh, uh, XXII, who's, I think, just been canonized. I've forgotten, but he's well on the way there. Um, not the Russian Orthodox Church. In 1992, according to a colleague in Warsaw, they canonized 1,200 saints in one day. And how did they do it? They took KGB mug shots, which you can see here, and they put gold foil around the faces. Now, they, you know, who knows if these people were shot right after? They were on the, the pratiquant, the fidel. They were priests, nuns, and religious people who were tortured and murdered by Stalin. No question about it. But it is the canonization of the victims of Stalin that has breathed new life into the cult of martyrdom as a form of remembrance of the sufferings over the, pla over the past century. This is, I think, an extraordinary difference that leads to my conclusion that there is no European memory regime. There are European memory regimes, and there is no solid basis for saying that there is a European memory or remembrance of the First World War. Now, I want to end on one point. This is my final point. Is there in some sense, an extraordinary opportunity today that maybe we historians can get back into the act, but not only us. Microphone, please. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Microphone here. Um, I promise not to move again. Is this a moment um, that can actually be creative in changing the narratives through acts of remembrance? And I think, yes. And the answer is a pure accident. I want to use... Um, the work of uh, the great uh, German scholars, the Egyptologist Jan Asman, uh, the polymath, his wife, Elida Asman, to develop this argument. Why now? Why this, or has this new commemorative moment focusing on victims rather than martyrs appeared and not 50 years ago? What the Asmans have done is to distinguish two kinds of remembrance. They call it me communicative memory and cultural memory. In our daily lives, we all listen to stories and tell them in turn. We engage in what the Asmans call communicative memory, in which we frame narratives about our past and that of our families in a social and domestic setting. 
We find out who we are by listening to stories about the group into which we were born, a family, a neighborhood, an ethnic group, a region, a nation. Halbach's put it, none of, us is the none of us is the first person to know who we are. We're always told that by our families. Gabriel Garcia Marquez said that everything he knew about his family, everything about 100 years of solitude, he learned at his grandmother's knee. My view is that grandmothers are the unrecognized historians of most of the world. That direct exchange lasts about three generations or the length of time which separates us now uh, from the outbreak of the Great War, from Gallipoli, from Verdun, and the Somme, and the Easter Rising. After the three-generation period of first-person storytelling, we do not have access to direct witnesses anymore, however accurate or fanciful they may have been. The group that framed our childhoods has vanished or mutated through death, migration, indifference, or intermarriage. First-person narratives are no longer there. I remember the day when is a thing of the past, when 1914, 1916, or 1918 are in question. At that precise moment, 100 years on, we have to resort to other kinds of storytelling embedded not only, or not in individual voices, but in documents, in sites, in rituals, and in the ceremonies surrounding them. This, Jan Asman calls cultural memory. Here is his phrasing. Cultural memory has its fixed point. Its horizon doesn't change with the passing of time. These fixed points are fateful events of the past whose memory is maintained through cultural formation, texts, rites, monuments, and institutional communication, recitation, practice, observance. We call these figures of memory. I want to draw you a parallel. It is precisely eight, uh, 100 years between 1863 and 1963. In 1963, Martin Luther King gave voice to a grand narrative of the civil rights movement. It was obscured for 100 years by two groups of men, two groups of white men who had different narratives. One of them was the, the, the doomed lost cause of the South. The other was the defense of the Union in the North. It took 100 years for the family stories of the US Civil War, which were implicitly or explicitly racist, to give way to the story they were intentionally hiding, that of black liberation. Families can not only create narratives, they can block other narratives from becoming visible to populations. A hundred years of the nationalist interpretation of the First World War, which has inevitably been the case, it seems to me we are now in a position of doing something different and telling the story in a transnational manner. And if we do that, it seems to me that, th that there is an opportunity in various parts of the world to make commemoration good history and a turn away from war at the same time. Thank you very much.